go on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. He is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. We are outside the presence of the jury. The state has rested its case. The defense moves for a directed verdict. When evaluating a motion for directed verdict, the court is not free to weigh the evidence and thus invade the province of the jury whose prerogative it is to judge the facts. Rather, the court's role is to determine whether the state has produced believable evidence on each element of the crime from which a jury acting reasonably could convict the defendant. The motion for directed verdict at the close of the state's case may be denied if the trial court finds that the state has established a prima facie case against the defendant, again by producing believable evidence of all elements of the crime charged. The court is required to view the evidence in the light most favorable to the state. If there is any evidence, however slight or circumstantial, which tends to show guilt of the crime charged or any of its degrees, it is the trial court's duty to submit the case to the jury. Applying that liberal standard to the proof that has been offered by the state, the court denies the motion for directed verdict as to both counts charged in the information. Let's have the jury in. Thank you. Please be seated. We are on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. He is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. The jury is seated. You may call your next witness. Governor, just before calling them, if I could have an exhibit marked. You may. showing that on April 10th of 2007, um, Michelle McNeil was prescribed um, oxycodone, uh, penicillin, and then um, uh, promethazine suppositories. Any objection to okay. that exhibit? It's uh, EE. E. Defendant's EE e. is received. Yeah, you may. Thanks. Mr. Besser, would you come forward here to the clerk's desk? Please raise your right hand and be sworn. Then you may be seated to my left. Thank you. Would you state your name for the record? Brett William Besser. Thank you. And how are you employed? 
Uh, I am a uh, industrial hygienist for the Department of Labor, OSHA, with a specialized um, training and emphasis in ergonomics. And what education uh, have you received in order to perform your, your, your job? Um, I have a master's degree in public health from the University of Utah, which had an emphasis in safety and ergonomics. And what is ergonomics? Uh, it's basically the, the um, study of people and work and how they interact um, to either work more effectively or to minimize the chance of injury. Does, does it involve um, uh, lifting? Yep, yep. How so? Um, well, actually, lifting is, is one of the things, at least for OSHA, that has been um, uh, studied the most. Uh, we um, Lifting um, in an occupational setting is probably one of the leading causes of, of injury. Um, and so we've tried to come up with recommendations as to what will uh, normally um, cause an injury, that there's been quite a bit of work done over the last... 30 years that uh, initially with cadaver spines um, to determine how much force it takes to basically crush the spine down and then they back extrapolated from that to how much l you could lift uh, and likely not injure uh, the spine. And have you received any, any particular certifications in relation to ergonomics? Yes, I'm a certified professional uh, ergonomist. And since when have you been certified? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. 99, 2000, somewhere in there. And uh, and since then, have you uh, continued to have experience in in the, in assessing um, lifting scenarios and yeah. capabilities of yep. people? That's, that's basically been uh, my occupation for the last. Well, I started that in 1991 and continue to do it today. Okay. And uh, were you asked uh, to, to examine um, a particular scenario in relation to, to the Martin McNeil case? Yes, the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And may I approach Your Honor? You may. I'm showing you two exhibits. Uh, one is Exhibit 16. Uh, do you recognize that? Mm, yes, that's the bathroom that we did the uh, test at. And then also exhibit 22. Do you recognize that? Um, yeah, that's a diagram of, of the layout of the uh, bathroom. And that's not your diagram? No. Did no. you do a similar diagram? I did. And uh, the dimensions, I believe, are in the report that, that I provided you. And so what, um, uh, what measurements were significant to you well, in during the report? Um, in, uh, to determine whether uh, somebody could do something, probably the critical uh, measurements here is the, um, should I be showing anybody in particular? <laughs> okay. Um, the fact that the shower stall is uh, blocking egress into the tub, so basically it would sit up against the uh, far end of the tub so that you can't get directly close to the tub uh, to lift out. The distance of the tub rim and the decorative tile work around the outside keeps you from um, getting close to the lift, and in lifting, the distance that you, the farther you reach out, the more uh, damage uh, or potential damage and more difficult the risk is. Um, not unlike um, a child on a teeter-totter, where you can have a small child way out on the end of the teeter-totter could lift up an adult who's sitting closer to the fulcrum. The far, farther that load moves out, the more compressive uh, pressure there is on your, on your discs and vertebrae and the, a greater chance you have of injury. So, um, we looked at that distance, which would basically move the load out away from the body, the lack of access on this side, and then the actual makeup of the tub to see how easy it would be to rearrange and move um, a load within the tub to try to get it closer so that it could be lifted. And 
you've um, used words such as damage and capability. Could you explain what is the relationship between those two descriptive phrases? Um, we basically look at the, um, especially with the NIOSH lifting equation and with the um, Michigan model, what they've looked at, like I explained before, is when you start getting these microfractures or, uh, or tears, microfractures in the vertebrae and tears in the discs. So your capability is, it really moves, tracks together the capability of, of performing the lift is uh, tracks along with the with the um, option that you're not going to get injured, so they kind of uh, track together. And of course, there does um, there are some things that um, you know certain individuals are not capable of doing, uh, like our 65 pound bags of dog food. My wife can't lift out of the car, but I can. So there is a capability based on your. Um, uh, particular anthropometry. Okay. And uh, in relation to um, uh, the, the scenario with the bathtub, what um, uh, conditions or, or assumptions did you make? Um, I was shown some pictures um, of the, uh, a um, idea of the bathroom scene, so I had kind of an idea of what the um, uh, person's position was in the tub, and then we went and um, we had a surrogate who was about the same size that we placed in the tub to see what kind of access, you know, how easy it would be to slide them over closer to where you could lift. Um, and then the, the rest of the um, uh, measurements we took, the, some of the things that are in there that are hard to, that can't really fit into these models is like the one picture here there's it appears like there's water splashed out on the floor and the tiles were a slick um, a slick surface so our models don't really work very well in how slippery a surface could be the better the better footing you have the better the easier that you can lift if it's off a slick surface your feet tend to slide out from you especially when you have to lean forward to uh, uh, to get access. Um, yeah. And so uh, did, did you use an assumption for a body position in the tub? Yes. We, uh, I looked at it and assumed that you would be able to slide the body around um, somewhat closer. Uh, as it turns out, the shape of the tub, you really can only move it into the um, uh, a, a really a pretty limited position because the shoulders end up conforming to the tub and as soon as you let off any pressure they roll right back into where um, into the deeper part of the tub so we, we set up a, a scenario where I believed um, you would have to start the lift from and uh, did our measurements from that point may I approach the tub you're on you may so this is a Representative tub. And yeah. May the step down? You may. This uh, red sticker here, uh, we have agreed, represents approximately the condition of the of the water faucet. Okay. Does, is that consistent with your recollection? Yeah. Yeah, they were off to the side. And so, for purposes of your calculations, uh, what what body position did you consider the was the subject, just for purposes of your calculation? Um, we enter with the shoulders in about this position. Um, as we move, tried to move it around, this would actually be a better position over here, but the, the body tends to slide back into this posture here, um, which is kind of impacted by the, the shallow wall that would be right here. Uh, so that's, that's about where we lifted from, and we it, it seemed to be pretty general that she was not laying flat on the bottom of the tub that we were able to get her up into a, a fairly sitting position. Um, although with somebody who's unconscious, it's pretty hard to tell um, how you'd be able to hold that position. But that's kind of created a best possible scenario. And uh, so we started with that and did those measurements. Okay. 
And so you just used an assumption from that point of view, obviously not knowing right. all of the factors of, of how Michelle McNeil may have been on April 11th, 2007, right? Exactly. And in relation to the to the assumption that you used, uh, you've, you've indicated that you used some NIOSH lifting standards. Mm -hmm. And is that a, a lifting standard that is generally accepted in in your industry? Yes, yes. That's probably the most uh, widely used tool because it doesn't require any additional software or anything. You can do the calculations yourself, and it does have validation in the workplace where they've been able to see a direct relationship between when the tool says you're going to have an injury that, in a workplace anyway, you also see injuries. And did you also, you, you referenced the Michigan? Michigan 3D static strength prediction model. Yeah. Okay. And so in relation to, to those those two, well, is the Michigan standard as well generally accepted in, in your, your industry? Yes, it is. It's a little less useful for us in in occupational setting because it really looks at the, uh, a one-time lift. What's the, as if the, the person were a crane or machine, what could they lift out of the tub or wherever you're trying to lift? And it doesn't take into account um, frequency, which, I mean, as most of us would know, the more you lift, the more tired you get, and it gets to be harder. So it's a little less used in occupational. Um, circle, but it's it's well respected. And so in occupational circles, the focus is more on damage control. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, yep. trying to keep a level that people are working at where they won't be hurt. Whereas uh, the Michigan formula is, is, as you indicated, just a one-time yes, it's, evaluation? Yes, it basically came out of their engineering department and treats the body as if it were a machine set of levers and cables and then they look at you know what your elbow or your shoulder or your back uh, is capable of doing and plug that in and measure all the forces and decide whether you'd be capable of doing it. And so as, as you did your site visit and and, uh, and used the assumptions that you did with, with a, a body sitting in the in the tub, mm -hmm. what um, uh, what measurements did you take in order to apply both the NIOSH and the Michigan standards? Um, we took the, the dimensions of the uh, uh, scene and then we hooked up a harness and determined what the force was using a force gauge to actually get somebody moving, lifting them up, um, and <coughs> yeah, basically how much it would take to get them lifted. And so you used a harness to, yes, to get the look. Did you take any measurements in relation to the the body position of the person potentially doing the lift? Yes, we did measurements, assumed uh, the body in in the tub, and measured how far the the person would have to reach with both the left and right hands, how far the distance was from the hands to the uh, to the critical part in the lower back and uh, how far, where the hands would be in position, either vertically or horizontally from the, uh, from the load, from the person. And are those measurements critical in order to apply both the NIOSH and the Michigan lifting standards? Yes, yes, particularly the horizontal distance that the, the load is away from the back. And, and why, does, why does that make a difference? Um, like, like I said before, sort of like a nutcracker, you know, you can't, you can't crack a nut in your hand Unless you're really, uh, uh, but if you can put a nut in the end of the jaw there and use the same force, leverage allows you to break the nut. And so the farther that load is away from you, the, the more, the harder it will be to lift, the more stress it takes, uh, puts a person to, and the, 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 it's, it's a greater chance of being injured and there's fewer people that are probably capable of doing the lift. You indicated that you used a, a, a meter to measure force, mm -hmm. and, and what is the significance of that? Um, the amount, uh, the person can weigh a certain amount, but the actual force or the weight that 
the, that you see in your lift is going to be different. I think our assumption was uh, victim uh, weighed about 180 pounds. What we saw through a number of different uh, measurements was that you would have to live, lift about 140 pounds um, uh, to do that particular lift. Okay. And uh, did you use different scenarios in relation to, uh, to lifting? Yeah, yeah, we well, did. We had first the lift, excuse me, um, we had a first lift that was uh, with our surrogate fully clothed with the harness on, lifted them up until we got them basically to about uh, mid sternum. And that was in, well, it's probably in the report, but we, we did that. It was in the 140, 150 pound range. Do you have a copy of your report? Uh, not up here. Mayor Pro May. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so our first lift, we had uh, readings of 147 pounds, 149 pounds, and 146 pounds. Then we had the um, surrogate put on a swimsuit. Uh, we filled the, Randy filled the tub of water to um, a level it seemed to me would be about a third. Uh, we put the harness back on and we got uh, readings of 92, 84, 119, 125, and 117. And then we drained the water out of the tub, um, still with the surrogate in the swimsuit and with the harness on, and we got readings of 145, 138, and 144. Okay. And, uh, did those readings also factor in to your calculations in relation to both the, the NIOSH lifting equation and the Michigan 3D? Yes, equation? what these, what the, both equations come up with, um, you basically put in the actual weight that you're lifting and it will give you a factor um, that, that in the case of the NIOSH lifting equation, it tells you what they consider to be a safe lift. And then you look at the actual weight lifted divided by the uh, uh, safe lift, and then in the um, uh, Michigan model, they take the weight that you have and they try to determine what percentage of the population would be capable of doing that. Okay. And did what variables did you consider in relation to the the person potentially doing the lifting? Uh, we the. Um, for the Michigan model, it when they say the population that it's capable of doing it, that population is, um, uh, in this case, we put in a 51-year-old man, about 6'2 and 206 pounds, um, because like I said with the dog food example, um, you know, if you were a linebacker for BYU, you might be able to do something that my wife and the dog food couldn't do. So. And were those assumptions um, th that you used um, consistent with your understanding of, of um, circumstances of Mr. McNeil on April 11th of 2007? Um, I guess I don't quite understand. <laughs> the 6'2", 206 pound, 51 year old person, was, was that roughly the assumptions you were yes, trying yes. to? Yes, yes. Okay. Matter of fact, the Michigan model actually has you put in those exact uh, parameters, the NIOSH lifting equation is a little more, um, it has, its, its assumption is that this is something that 99% of the male work population could do and 75% of the female work population could do. So it's not quite as robust as far as the, the, the group that you, um, that would be capable of doing it, but there's some pretty good recognition that as you start to get to be over 40 years old, you start to lose muscle mass and, you know, the vagaries of life take their toll. And uh, in relation to the NIOSH lifting equation, uh, what um, did you conclude after you, you put the variables into the equation? Um, that the way the lifting equation works out is you have a lifting index that says this is safe and that's basically off of uh, occupational studies and um, scientific literature that says, if it says that 15 pounds is safe and you're actually lifting 15 pounds under these conditions, most people can do this. Um, then it goes up to 
at a level that's about three times uh, what um, that level, that that's a level that at that level or above most of the working population will be injured. And then between one and three, it's an increased risk of injury. Um, I believe we had um, <laughs> there's there's a little bit of variation there, but we had a lifting index that was between 11.6 and 12.5. So a level of three, most people would be uh, injured. Um, and uh, so this is about three or four times what the what you would consider to be the safe level. And so, does uh, the fact that that this lifting index was three or four times what would be considered safe uh, lead to uh, any conclusions in your opinion regarding capability? Um, yeah, I would I would say that at those levels, it's highly unlikely that that someone would be able to do that now. You know, everybody hears about the woman that pulls her car off of her child, and so it's not to say that it's impossible, but it would be quite a lift. And to tell you the truth, when I was doing the lift with the surrogate, with the harness, and in much better situations, uh, I'm not sure that I could have gotten them out. So. And what about with the the Michigan 3D? Um, model. The Michigan 3D model goes in and what it provides you is a compressive load on the spine um, and it gives you a set of graphs that says for the particular body linkages, you know, a person of this particular um, body size, um, how many would be able to do that? And from that model, um, the knees, knees, ankle, and hips um, all said that, that it would not be possible to do it, but that was really very hard to line up or to ascertain because um, with the slick surface and, you know, to make sure that we really didn't know exactly how we would have the uh, postures. But for the shoulders, uh, it said that no, no percentage of the population would be able to do it, and for the um, torso, about 7% of the population that was equivalent to um, uh, Mr. McNeil's um, size would be able to do that. And uh, based upon the Michigan standards, did you draw any conclusions in relation to capability of under these assumed circumstances? of a Yeah, I, you know, that it would be um, highly unlikely. Highly unlikely that likely that you know supposedly seven percent of the group could do that, um, but you know. It The first is the capability, is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. And the second is the likelihood of injury. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting that a person would not be justified in attempting to retrieve their spouse from a tub because of risk of injury? No. Uh, I guess in this case, it's the risk of injury is directly related to the capability, and I don't think that um, that sort of capability um, can be assumed. It certainly might be capable, but uh, it's not. It's not likely based on the models that we have. Okay. So, but but much <laughs> much of your report has to do with the risk of injury, correct? Mm -hmm. And all of your sources 
your relevant sources except for the equations have to do with risk of injury, correct? Yes. Yes. Although I, I guess as a follow-up on that, the, the proof of capability in many cases is the lack of injury. So I think they, they track along. Well, certainly, but I mean, you could do something and accomplish that task and hurt yourself, right? Mm, yes. So you could be hurt, but still the task is feasible. Mm, yes. Speaking generally. Yes. Um, do you still have the exhibit with the tub, the picture of the tub? Yes. Um, you say the shower stall is blocking egress to the back side of the tub. Yes. How much of the tub is being blocked? Um, a little past the drain, I guess. A little forward of the drain. This way? Yes. Pointing away from the faucet for the purpose of okay. the You're saying like around this area? Um, perhaps a little farther, but yeah, area? probably in there. Okay, so you can come to right here. Um, well, except for there's the decorative. Right yeah. How far does the tile come out right here? Uh, I think we had it at five inches. Here and how far here? Uh, a little less. Okay, so you can come to right here basically. Yeah. And you've seen a lot of bathtubs where the bathtub meets right up to the shower. Right. You? Right. This isn't like that. No. No. There is. It's along the edge, um, and it's. Yeah. It's. It's. Okay. Uh, it doesn't completely block egress, but. Sure. Um, you talked about water being on the floor. Do you have any information to support the inference, or the assumption that there was water on the floor at this time? Just this picture. Are you aware of when this picture was taken? Nope. Okay. If I told you this picture was taken long after Michelle was at the hospital, would that change your opinion? Um, well, no. I guess I would, you know, my assumption of the slipperiness of the floor is based on the fact there was water there and the, and the picture was given to me as a representation of what the bathroom looked like at some point in time. I really don't know. So I asked you if there was um, a reason to think the floor was wet, and you said the picture, but mm -hmm. now you're saying also because there was water involved. Well, only based on what I saw in the picture. Oh, I understand. Okay. When, I, when we were there, there was no water on the floor. You talk a lot about ergonomics and potential danger and how ergonomic intervention, including the use of electronic or mechanical devices, to help in patient transfer mm -hmm. is a promising approach for redu reducing back injury, basically. Yes. Are you suggesting by that that Michelle should, we should have waited with Michelle until we could have mechanical means to extract her from the tub? If it was, if you wanted to do it in a completely safe manner, yeah. But I don't know. I don't think that from what I've understood, that she was later brought out when there was somebody else to help, which would be another means of, of uh, performing that. Okay. I want to go through your supporting documentation a little bit. Um, the first piece is the patient care and ergonomics resource guide. Are you familiar with this? Uh, generally. Did you bring that with you? No. Do you know what the purpose in the target audience is for that? Um, it is primarily health care uh, and of those primarily nurses, nursing assistants, those who do uh, routine lifting. That's the, the target audience. What is the purpose of the, the guide? Uh, to try to give um, guidance to administrators and staff on how to uh, evaluate potential lifting situations and to perform um, uh, their activities, required activities, in a safe manner. Could I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Um, I don't 
I want to kill a tree, just to ask you a few questions. Okay. So I've got this on my iPad here. Do you recognize this? I can go to the top mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah, it's the it's the VA's it appears to be the VA's safe patient lifting. Okay, and this is the thing that you cited to, correct? Mm-hmm. Portions of it. Yeah. yeah. Will you read um, that first paragraph under the purpose of Chapter One overview for me? The goal of this guidebook is to reduce the incidence and severity of job-related injuries related to patient handling and movement tasks. While there is much to learn about the science of safe patient moving and handling, the tools provided in their current form can serve as a cognitive, uh, oh, as cognitive aids for both caregivers and patients derived from best practices within and outside the healthcare, or outside healthcare. The program elements described in this guidebook have been tested within the Veterans Administration Hospital and are being fully implemented on 25 nursing home care units and spinal cord injury units within VISN 8, which is, I assume, the veterans and some sort of a uh, group within the Veterans Hospital. It's some kind of acronym, right? Yeah. So fair to say that that, that source is about best practices in the occupation of, of, of moving patients. Yes. It's not speaking to what you necessarily do when you encounter a spouse who's unresponsive in a bathtub. Right, right. Although there is, they do have those si sorts of situations in healthcare, not a spouse, but a, somebody that they're working with that could be in that sort of situation. And so as part of the training, they would try to um, educate the um, caregivers as to what is a harmful situation, what's a, um, a situation that they should not attempt to um, uh, perform a lift from. But there's nothing in this source about specifically what you do when you encounter this kind of a situation? Uh, not that I've seen. Okay. Um, similarly, I want to go to your next source, which was uh, a comprehensive analysis in lower back disorder. Do you remember this one? Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, not particularly. This, uh, this was a study, and they used 17 participants, 12 experienced and 5 inexperienced, to measure the potential for lower back injury. Okay. Do you remember it now? No. But you didn't bring it with you? No. Nope. Are you familiar with the term statistical significance? Yes. Are you familiar with the term sample size? Yes. Based on your understanding of those two principles, is this study with 17 participants, 12 experienced, and five inexperienced scientific? Yes. It doesn't have a great deal of power to it, but it's... It's uh, depending on how it was performed and controlled, and uh, it would be scientific. Do you remember how it was controlled? Nope. Do you remember what the conclusion of the study was? No. Fair to say the conclusion was therefore to have an impact on lower back disorder. It is necessary to provide mechanical lift assist devices. Was this a, a study from Bill Maris? I believe so. Okay. Yeah, I think his conclusion was that there's basically, other than small children, there's really no safe way to lift people and that if you wanted to uh, eliminate um, injury, uh, increase the work, the work group of work people that were capable of doing the task, that you'd have to go to mechanical lifts. Well, if, if safety isn't an issue, then why are we discussing safety today? If, safe, I, if safety isn't an issue, then what? Well, you said, my understanding of what you just said is that they're talking about safety and injury and how that relates to it, and you're trying to control for injury, correct? Right. Is that what we're talking about today, controlling for injury? Mm, we're, try, we're talking about, about capability to perform, which if you have somebody who tries to perform a task that they're not capable of, they're likely to be injured. Okay, and this study doesn't speak to capability. This study speaks to 
injury? Um, depending on what the, I, I'm assuming that they use the lumbar motion monitor, which goes in and does a, a particular set of parameters and evaluates whether most people could do that. And if most people couldn't do it, most of the work population couldn't do it, they're likely to be injured. Are you saying that that's what they did in this study? I don't know. You don't remember? Okay. I know that Bill Marish usually uses the lumbar motion monitor, so it probably is. Uh, your next source was uh, patient handling movie at movement in a perioperative setting. Remember that one? Mm, not specifically. This is a manual. You don't remember this From, one? Uh, American Association of Registered Nurses? or I think it's American Organization. Is that right? Okay. AORN? It could be AORN, yeah. And that's about current ergonomic safety concepts and scientific evidence to promote a safer perioperative work environment and protect perioperative team members. What does perioperative mean, by the way? Postoperative, I believe. Isn't it preoperative? Could be. Okay. Uh, Some place around the operator. Some, somewhere around the operation. Yeah. And so they're talking about moving patients from here to there in a safe way. Right. They're not talking about emergency situations. Um, I guess there could be emergency situations, but basically they're looking at um, uh, routine movement, which that's going to be much more of their their occupational job than emergencies. Right, and they they don't address emergencies. They address, I mean, pre-operation. You're okay. Yeah. Um, You also cited to a study called lifting patients poses high risk for back injury study or a study showing that. Do you remember this one? Uh, no, not from the title. Do you have your report there in front of you? Mm, yes. This is the first one you put a website for. Uh, lifting in the, in patients. In the bibliography. Mm -hmm. in the pertinent sort supporting documentation. Uh, oh, okay. Do you remember this one? Um, sort of. The, uh... Can I approach your honor? You may. Does this look like that study? Mm. Yeah, probably. Okay. Who's the author of this? Uh, of this study? Yeah, it's out of Ohio State. It's probably Bill Maris and, and his group working at Ohio State. Yeah. So is, this is the exact same study as the one you previously cited to, isn't it? Um, I don't know. They, they've done several, so. Well, there's, there's 17 participants. Okay. 12 were professional, 5 were non-professional okay. done by the same author you call him bill maris mm -hmm. is it safe to say it's the same one probably although it's probably not the study it's probably a abstract of the study but yeah it's probably the same set of data i think it's an article that alludes to the same study right um this study yielded some surprising results didn't it mm, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm leading you. Okay. <laughs> I want you to read this highlighted portion of this article you cited. Okay. The study yielded some surprising results. For instance, when two people shared the work of lifting and moving the patient, they didn't lessen their load very much. Okay. Separate that. Okay. So according to Bill Maris, 
when two people shared the work of lifting, that didn't lessen the load very much for them individually. That's, that's what he states. I believe that he's probably saying if you have somebody that's very heavy, two people can still be over the, over the, uh, at a point where they're, they could be injured. But, uh, and in, in the context of a typical hospital situation, one of the things they've tried to do is say, well, we'll just assign teams of two to lift people rather than to provide lifting assist. And what they, I believe, have looked at, I don't know uh, the whole study, but that people are still at risk because of the postures and um, positions that people have to work from. I don't think that's what he said. He said they didn't lessen their load very much. What is the load? It's the amount they have to carry, correct? Yeah, I think if you go to the next sentence, it explains that. I want you to read this right here. Okay. Um, I was surprised that having two people work together did not significantly lower their similarity to high-risk jobs. We think that when two people are doing the lifting, they may be fighting each other somewhat. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I guess, his postulation on why that might be the case. Uh, one of several, I think. He also recommends that they give mechanical lifting devices. Mm-hmm. You think he's sponsored by these lifting device groups? I don't know. These universities have a lot of uh, sources of uh, income. But again, back to what he said, he said when two people shared the work of lifting, that didn't lessen the load very much. Are you aware of how many people it took to lift Michelle out of the tub? No. I heard that there was one other neighbor that helped, but I don't know if there was more than one. Um, you also cited to NCCI releases study on safe lifting programs at long-term care facilities. Do you remember this one? Um, no, not in specifics. Okay. Can I approach again, Your Honor? You may. I didn't want to cut down the tree for this one either. <laughs> That's fine. Um, does that look like the article you cited to? You can blow this up if you need to. Oh, that, would, that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, that looks... Looks familiar? Yeah. Okay. And isn't it true that the objective of this research was to assess the implications for workers' compensation costs to save uh, from injury with lifting programs at long-term care facilities? Mm, it probably could have been. Well, that's what it says, right? Oh, well, if that's what it says, that's probably so because this one well, injury equates to increased workers comp so right so this one is a, again isn't addressing our situation and this one isn't even addressing manual removal this one is talking about the um, use of of a safe lift program everything they compared in here all of the um, all of the homes that they studied in here already had mechanical lifting devices and here the comparison was working workers compensation costs between the ones that implicate or that used a safe lifting program and those that didn't. Correct? Um, I'd have to read the study again, but I would imagine that, that would, they were probably looking at something that would reduce a program that would reduce the likelihood of injury. Okay. So again, it's not really talking about our situation here. Well, except for the fact that when you have, as part of these programs, you evaluate the lifting situations that you're going to be in potentially and evaluate those and if you start to have a um, if you have situations that you've identified that where you would be injured then they would go and make changes in those situations to allow people to 
perform the, a wide variety of people to perform the task without being injured. Sure, but we're talking about one task here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about multiple tasks. We're not talking about pre-planned safety precautions. Right. Your next one is the NIOSH hazard review. You remember this one? Uh, not specifically, but... Okay. I approach? May. Does this look familiar? Yes. Is that it? Um, uh, keep going. You can keep going. Just yeah, I would imagine. Am I saying that right? They call it NIOSH? NIOSH, yep. Okay. National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And in this one, they discuss all kinds of things. They discuss injury, they discuss allergy, they discuss um, pathogens, they discuss occupational stress, even violence, correct? Mm -hmm. And it's to raise awareness and increase understanding of safety and health risks involved in health care and prevention strategies. Right. Again, it's not talking about the situation we're discussing today. not in its entirety. I'm sure it has a section talking about capability of lifting, but no. I want to talk to you um, a little bit about the RWL. What does that stand for again? Recommended weight limit. Okay. And I'm, I have to admit I'm not an ergonomist, but I've been trying to understand this formula a little bit better. Okay. This and, and, and what this stands for, the RWL is to determine a recommended limit on the amount a person should lift, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, <laughs> in this instance, we have a number of, of factors that go into this equation, correct? Mm -hmm. And we have a load lifting, we have a, a horizontal, what does the M stand for? Multiplier. Multiplier. We have a vertical multiplier, and I've got this somewhere. I've got to pull this up. And we have a coupling factor, correct? Mm -hmm. What does the coupling factor stand for? Coupling factor is a recognition that it's less strenuous to lift something that you have a good hold of, say, if you have handles. Um, it's a fairly minor component um, in it. It, it with a very bad coupling, you reduce the amount that could be lifted by about five or ten percent, I believe. Would it be fair for me to call the coupling factor grabability? The ability to grab and hold on. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and you used a, a coupling factor of poor. Is that correct? Right. Um, and what is the the coupling factor? These are these are assumption based constants, correct? Uh, no, there is actually. Well, are you talking about my assumption or the people who made the tool? The people who made the tool. The people who made the tool actually had people lift, and it's a a uh, actually a psychophysical data that, you know, what you feel comfortable lifting, what you're able to lift, they run multiple, um, uh, multiple um, trials uh -huh. and determine what, uh, that, um, what people feel they can lift and, and are willing to lift. Okay, so um, we, what, what you've done, and I'm not saying you're right or wrong, I'm saying you've made an assumption as to the grappability of this situation, correct? Right. right. And you've made that assumption as poor, and because of that, you put in a coupling factor for that. Will you look at the equation and show me which one was the coupling factor? Let's see here. Yeah. Um.
at least in what I've got printed here, I didn't actually add the coupling factor in or gave it a factor of one. So, Isn't the one your frequency? It probably is. So which one's the coupling factor? So it's probably not... Uh, it's probably not in this particular one. I do have the... You don't know which one of these is your coupling factor? Well, if it goes in line with the way it's listed on the rest of it, it would be uh, not in this formula. So you missed that? Um, well, I missed it in typing it into the report. The question is whether I missed it in the actual calculation. Do you want to do the calculation right now and see? Uh, no, but I could go and get the actual calculation and... Is it here? Yeah. Would you go grab it? If, uh, with leave of the court. Is he leaving? No, he's just going back here. Okay. find that yeah so are you are you telling me that your figure of the 11.2 is wrong or you just failed to reflect the coupling factor in your report it appears that I neglected to put it into the report I have 0.9 as a coupling multiplier in here with the with the um, final result is 11.18 and that's how you got to 11.2, you rounded up. Right. Okay. Um, and in your, in your computation for a vertical factor or the VM, mm -hmm. um, you used uh, Michelle's height of 68 inches, correct? Uh, no, probably not. Um, I used probably used her height of 68 inches to determine what her seated armpit height would be at. Can I approach her, Honor? You may. Can I show you the report? Mm -hmm. So right here, this is the vertical factor, correct? Right. And you said based on Michelle's height of 68, degree, or 68 In inches. inches, he would need to lift her approximately 26 inches to get her hips out of the top. Oh, okay, yeah, yep. So yeah. you used a height of 68 inches in order to compute your vertical factor? Right. Okay. And the longer a person is, the more significant that vertical factor is going to be. Um, well, I guess it depends on what you're doing with them. But okay, so in this in situation... Let's say 68, 68 inches, according to your calculation, right. you have to get 26 inches, right? Right. I have that same person seated in the exact same situation. Their legs are coming up here, and they're seven feet tall. I'm going to have to pull them up a lot higher, right? Right. Okay. Right. Um, does the and, – and here you used a frequency of one because we're talking about one task, right. correct? Right. Um, does your RWL take into account a multiplier or a variable for adrenaline? No. It does not take nope. that into account? No. Nope. And you said you've heard of situations where a mother on adrenaline lifted tremendous loads in order to save a child or something. Anecdotally, yes. You haven't heard of them personally? I've never actually seen a case description of this happening, but... Everybody talks about the love of a mother and what they can do. So, mm -hmm. um, This RWL can be computed in kilograms or in pounds, correct? Yes. And you computed it into pounds. Yes. And so your RWL in this situation was 11.2 pounds. Yes. And that's to get a lifting index. Well, you use that in order to compare with the lifting index, correct? Uh, to com yeah, to compute the lifting index. Okay. And so, if I'm understanding this right, under your computation, you're saying that the 
the safe or the recommended weight limit is 11.2 pounds. Yes. Okay. And you talk about how we want in ergonomics, mm -hmm. the RWL to be comparable to the lifting index. Yes. Because when it starts getting in multiple, like to three, like you said, a lifting index of three, that's when injury starts. Well, no, actually anything over one injury starts. When it gets to three, oh, I apologize. injury is almost likely to happen, although that's where the this particular model breaks down just a little bit because that is looking at an occupational lifetime. So. Right. And you, you say in your report, a, a going above three represents an unacceptable risk of injury. And a lifting index, let me... Yeah, yeah well, a, a high risk of injury, yes. Well, didn't you say unacceptable risk? Um, I think that I probably said unacceptable risk at the point where you're at 11, a lifting index of 11, not a lifting index of 3. But Okay, let's see. I mean, anything's possible. <laughs> we could read this, just this sentence starting with there, right there. Let's see. Can safely lift a weight with a lifting index of... No, starting with there. Oh, oh right. starting here? I say there and I point there, but I mean T-H-E-R-E. Oh, now, now you've got really got me confused. There is also. Oh, okay. Uh, there is also general agreement that most of the workforce will be at an unacceptably in, unacceptable increased risk of injury when the lifting index rises above three. So the calculated that's lifting right. index of... That's all I wanted. Okay. So I guess anything's possible. You said unacceptable increased risk when the lifting increase rises above three. Yes. Okay. So for example, if we take 11.2, and we times it by a lifting index of three, we get 33.6 pounds. Yes. And you're saying that 33.6 pounds in this situation creates an unacceptable risk of injury. Yes, it greatly increases the risk of injury. So under these circumstances, a person should use a mechanical device. Well, if they have it available, it certainly should. Okay, so let me give you a hypothetical. Um, if a person is in the same situation and they have a 35-pound child unresponsive in the tub, does that create an unacceptable risk of injury to get them out? Uh, I'm going to object to the, to the hypothetical. I think it's, a, it's an incomplete and inapplicable hypothetical. Uh, Overruled, he may answer. Um, I don't know that it would be unacceptable, but it's it would certainly put you at greater risk to lift somebody 33 pounds from that posture, yes. Well, and you said that it's an unacceptable risk previously, didn't you? Well, actually, I said that, that NIOSH considers at three, at three times the lift, or that RWL, that uh, they consider it to be an unacceptable risk. And that is looking at an occupational situation where you can design a um, work process. Okay, so that's, in other words, it's inapplicable to this situation. It's not designed for this situation, but it's not inapplic in, inapplicable in that it, at a higher risk, you're more likely to have injury or be incapable of doing the task. But according to your NIOSH, NIOSH citation, your calculation, with this time including the coupling factor, a 51-year-old who is 6 feet, 2 inches, 206 pounds, would have an unacceptable risk of injury lifting 33.6 pounds out of this situation. Well, now I think the NIOSH said that in a work situation, 3LI three, three is generally unacceptable. In this situation, I said that at uh, 11.6, so if you took your same thing and you had 186 pounds, that that's probably an unacceptable lifting situation. I want to go back to the thrust of your opinion. Um, in your opinion, 
you say that you are addressing whether a 51-year-old man with the stature of 6 feet and 2 inches uh, weighing 205 pounds could lift his unresponsive spouse from a jetted tub by himself. That's your, yes. your task, so to speak, right. correct? Did you compute anything to this same situation with two female adults offering to assist him get her out? No. Um, and, and one of the factors that obviously plays a role in all of this is the patient, right? Correct. And in this, in your report, you talk about Michelle being borderline obese, correct? Right. And this is based on BMI. Right. What is BMI? Body mass index, basically how much you weigh versus how tall you are. Okay. And what makes a person obese as it relates to a BMI score? That they're, that they're too heavy for how tall they are. Okay. Um, let me ask it this way. What is the score for obesity? Um, well, at least the websites I looked at had it at, they looked at, had it at about 30. Okay, 30 is pretty standard, correct? Mm -hmm. um, isn't it true that body mass index is higher in women than in men? Um, yeah, generally. What? Okay, we're speaking in generalities, right? Right. And um, All right. it's actually that women, as I understand it, women generally have a higher BMI than men do. Okay. So it's generally higher. Yeah. Okay. And, but the, you still use the exact same equation to compute BMI, whether you're a man or a woman. Yes, you do. Okay. And BMI is highest for women as they approach age 50, correct? Mm. I don't know. I think you could be heavier for your height, no matter what age well, you're at, but... We're not really talking about possibilities, we're talking about generalities. And you've cited to a number of sources on obesity and obese America and how people are getting fatter and it makes them harder to move around, right? And so generally, a woman's uh, BMI score is highest as she approaches age 50. It, it, yeah, it probably gets higher as she gets older. Well, and then it goes down once they hit 60, correct? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. Well, in other words, higher BMI is, the highest BMI for a woman is, for, for a person is going to be if it's a woman and if she's 50 years old. Uh, yeah, I guess there's statistical data that would show that. I don't know. Okay, I want to sure, do some math with you. Okay. Um, you computed BMI for Michelle McNeil, correct? Yes. And what, uh, what metrics did you use for that? Um, the definitions that are the... The um, what was given me that she was five foot six and one hundred and eighty two pounds. Okay. Now we previously talked about vertical factor. <laughs> we talked about how vertical factor is more significant the taller a person is, right? It's yes. And in that situation, you used a height of 68 inches, correct? Yes. And in the BMI, weight, or excuse me, height is inversely proportional to BMI. Isn't that true? Mm, it, yeah, if the weight is, is continual, if the weight is the same, then the BMI would get less as you get taller. Right. So... The lower the height with the same weight, mm -hmm. the higher the BMI. Yes. Okay. Your Honor, can we have permission to set this yeah, up? Yeah, go ahead. And so, interestingly, when it comes to vertical, um, the vertical factor, you use 68 inches in height, correct? But when it comes to BMI, you use 66 inches. Yep, I guess I did. Now both of these kind of support your position, don't they? In what way? Well, if, if you if you want to have the position that it's harder to pull her out, you want a higher BMI. Um, and you want a higher vertical factor. 
Well, actually, it doesn't really make any difference what our BMI is. The, the fact that the general point that was being made was that this was a significant weight, which was actually more, um, more solidly brought up by the fact of how much we had to weigh, how much we had to lift using the scale when we actually did the models. Okay. So there wasn't a direct relationship of BMI going into any of the, the studies or the tools that we used. Sure. Well, there is in, in terms of the vertical factor because the taller you are, the harder it is to pull you out. And if you're shorter, that will affect your vertical factor. And if you're shorter, that will affect your BMI. The, the vertical factor is how far you have to lift them out. But the real critical part is how much force do you have to exert to lift them out. Okay. So, I mean, BMI is just a general thing that that puts it into some sort of perspective. But right, and you used BMI because you you wanted to be able to say that this is a pretty heavy person we're lifting out of the tub, correct? Right. It's not. No. Yeah. No, that's, okay. That's... Um, and you had a BMI of twenty nine point four. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'll write that right here. Do you know the formula for converting BMI? To converting to BMI. Um, Safe to say that BMI can be um, calculated by taking the weight in kilograms, mm -hmm. dividing that. I'm going to use that for division. We should come down here. I, no, I sure. hate to talk to you this far. <laughs> nice boots, by the way. I well, like those. You. Okay, so weight divided by um, the height in, in meters squared, or, or, and the height is squared, correct? Does this equal BMI? Um, you know, I'm not sure. You don't remember? No. Okay. It's not something I use. I calculate very often, and I look it up when I need to calculate. It. Okay. Um, so I want to do this this math with you because this is the number you computed, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have here, or no, I brought it down here, a copy of Michelle McNeil's autopsy. Okay. Okay. What is what is her height according to this autopsy? 172 centimeters. And in meters, what is that? Uh, 17 point or 1.72. 1.72, right? And what is her weight in kilograms at the time of the autopsy? Uh, 83 kilograms. So 83, right? Do you have a calculator? Nope. Do you have an iPhone? Uh, no, I left it back there, so I didn't have a chance of it going off. Council, do you need one? I don't know if oh, this yeah. will work. Thank you. Yep. So will you, will you square 1.72 for me? Do you have another number? Uh, it's actually 2.9584. 9584. Okay. And will you take 83 and divide it by 2.9584? Okay. What is that? 28.055705. 28 28.06? So this is what Michelle McNeil's BMI was actually, correct? Mm -hmm. And you put 29.4. That was the calculation I made from the information that I had. What information did you have? The, I was given that um, by Randy. Uh, do, you, do you remember in what form? Uh, email, I believe. Was it a copy of the autopsy? No. It was something else? Right. Okay. Now, um, are you aware that there's been testimony that when emergency responders came to assist Michelle McNeil, but they gave her a deep wound, calcium and all kinds of stuff. No. Checked in your honor relevance. Uh, overruled, it goes to weight, right? right? Overruled. So let's say um, they worked on her for a couple of hours, mm -hmm. or let's just say an hour, you know, pumping fluids into her. Let's say, just as an assumption, that there were two kilograms 
of fluid injected into her for emergency services, okay? okay. Before she's taking the autopsy. So I'm going to put 81 here for 81 kilograms. I'm taking out 2 kilograms. This will remain the same, correct? Because her height didn't change. Right. So I'm going to do 2.9584. Will you do this calculation for me? Premature. So if we accept the assumption that she was given two kilograms of IV fluid, then her body mass index would actually be 27.37, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You can be seated. Thanks. And um, based on the literature, and you've studied a lot of obesity literature, 27.07 for a 50-year-old female is not that significant. I don't know. I'd have to look at the ranges. There's a range from normal to, to obese, and then from obese to morbidly obese. But I don't have that okay. right here. Um, I want to talk to you about this top 7% figure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm trying to figure this out because in your report, you say, according to these calculations, only about 7% of the population would have sufficient torso strength um, to perform the lift, basically, right? Yes. Um, in, in anywhere in your report, did you say the population is specific to the defendant or is that that's today, you've said That's that. That's today. Okay, so when you say population, you don't mean every man, woman in the United States. You're talking a population of 51 year old, six foot two inch, 206 pound males. Right. And again, your conclusion is. Not that this is impossible, but you think that it's highly unlikely based upon the calculations, some of which we've reviewed today. Yes. Okay. I have a moment, Your Honor. May. Heavily direct. Body mass, a variable in your calculations? No. Uh, is water on the floor a variable in your calculations? No. I, there's not, they're not a variable in the calculation. I think I did put in the conclusion that that could make the lift more difficult to do than the calculations would indicate. But, but, no. that's, but that's separate from your conclusions from the calculations. Yes. Right. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Do you have questions for this witness? Pass them to the end of the row. Anyone? May he be released from his subpoena? Yes, we don't object. Thank you. You'll be released. Uh, you may step down. Thank you. Would you collect materials here? I'm not sure whose they are. Okay. Will you just make sure we're not having exhibits walk out? Thank you. Does the state intend to call rebuttal witnesses? We do not, Your Honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the presentation of evidence. Tomorrow morning, beginning at 8.30, I will read some final jury instructions to you. We will hear closing argument from counsel, and then the case will be submitted to you for deliberation. Until that time, remember my admonition. It's your duty not to discuss 
any subject of the trial with anyone, including family or friends that you may see tonight or with each other. It's your duty not to form or express any opinion about how the case should be decided until it is submitted to you for deliberation. Avoid television, radio, or internet news coverage of the trial. Do no research on your own using computers or something else. I will see you at 8.30 in the morning. So why don't we take uh, maybe 15 minutes, take a break, get your jury instructions, and we'll uh, begin that process. Court's in recess.